Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So today we are going to be talking about HBase, which is a database that is built on top of Hadoop. So this is going to be a quick diversion off of the course of talking about batch processing, uh, which we're going to be doing right after this, since you know now we're starting to get into all of that fun stuff. Um, and even though there's plenty to cover there, let's go ahead and get started by talking about HBase. I've got to get into the gym after this because I ate a ton of deep dish pizza this weekend and I ruined my cut. So let's get into it and I will see you on the iPad. All right, so assuming that you're not a phony, you've obviously watched last video about Hadoop. Uh, but considering that most of you are phonies, you probably haven't. So in that case, uh, let's do a quick recap and say that HDFS, or Hadoop Distributed File System, is effectively just a distributed way of storing a bunch of different files uh, in a manner that is fault tolerant, redundant, all that good stuff. But the issue with it is something that we're going to talk about, which is that when we actually have a file stored and we want to make a modification to it, it's very inefficient. So here's an example of a file right here in Hadoop. And as you can see, we've got some information. Let's think of this as a key value store where we've got all of our attractiveness levels of some common characters that we're all familiar with. As you can see, Jordan, 10 out of 10, as expected. But the issue is, let's go ahead and say that Elon, after uh, you know limiting the amount of Twitter posts that we can see, has now become a 5 out of 10. Well, in Hadoop, at least, there's no way that we can just go ahead and make an ad hoc edit to just one file at a time and edit one piece of data on disk. In fact, we would have to overwrite the entire file. And in reality, these files aren't just going to be four lines long. They're going to be many, many megabytes. And as a result of that, doing such an operation is extremely expensive, especially when you have to consider network and replication costs. So in reality, if we are operating a Hadoop cluster and we want to be able to take the data that we already have and modify it, just using vanilla HDFS probably isn't a great solution unless we plan on overwriting files all the time, which, like I said, is going to be slow and expensive. So this is going to segue us into HBase, where HBase is effectively a database that we've built on top of Hadoop. And by we, I mean a bunch of rando nerds on the internet. And so number one is that HBase is going to allow us to do a bunch of, you know, kind of in the moment writes and key updates. Because keep in mind, like I said, the issue before is that we had to overwrite an entire file. And what HBase is going to do is use an intelligent architecture to make sure that we can actually make edits in the moment. We do so via LSM trees, which is a type of database index that we've discussed uh, plenty on this channel, but I will do a quick overcap or rather recap uh, on the next slide. And then additionally, we can also do a lot of batch processing due to the data locality that HBase gives us. It does this via using column-oriented storage, we've also discussed this in the past, and also range-based partitioning, which keeps data with similar keys close together on the same partition. So let's quickly talk about the HBase data model because fundamentally it's very similar to Cassandra, but in reality these two databases should be used for generally different things. So again, it's going to be a wide key column store, which if you can think about it means that we are in fact using a NoSQL database here. And again, that is similar to Cassandra in the sense that every row has to have a certain part of information and then you've got all this other stuff that is pretty much just optional. And you know, you can either have it or you don't have to have it, but we do need certain parts of the row uh, that comprise something known as our row key. And our row key is basically what determines in HBase how things are getting partitioned and also the order in which they're stored. Like I mentioned, everything is done by range-based partitioning, so we're not taking the hash of this key, we're literally just partitioning the data right down the segment as if it were ordered. Now, of course, you could be smart about this and like literally take what would have been your row key and just like put in the hash of that part over there and then that effectively becomes hash-based partitioning but my point is out of the box you know it's range-based partitioning and we'll see why that's good in a little bit at least for the use case that we want so let's start talking about architecture because that's really what sets HBase apart and as I mentioned it is built on top of Hadoop so we've got this master node right here and if you've watched our Hadoop video that's very similar to the concept of the name node where we have this one centralized place which is effectively just a metadata store and keeps in memory where all of the files that we care about are located where their replicas are what versions we have etc etc 
So basically, we've got our client over here on the top left, and whenever a client wants to perform a write to HBase, which is what's important, it basically goes to the master node and says, where do we want to write to? The master node will then respond with write to node two. So in this case, node two would effectively be the partition that the client should be writing to, and then the client is going to execute that write over here to node two. Now you may see that on each of these nodes, imagine that each of these big boxes is one single computer in our Hadoop cluster, blah, 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 blah. We have two boxes within that, a region node and a data node. So the data node is actually a term that we've discussed in our Hadoop video. And the region node is HBase. And that, the region node is going to be a separate process from HDFS running in memory, likely on the same computer as the data node. Then of course, we've got all of our high availability stuff over here, high availability, because of course, if the master node goes down, we don't want to have the entire system go down. So what we typically will do is we'll send all of the operations that are occurring on the master node over to Zookeeper, which then can be read by a secondary master node. So if the master were to go down, the secondary can take over. So again, we now have this concept of a region node and a data node. And keep in mind that our writes are being sent to a specific region node. Let's go ahead and zoom in on that and learn a little bit more. So when we examine our region node, what's actually happening? Well, basically, the region node is what is operating our LSM tree index. So let's again discuss this. We've got a client. And to recall, the client is going to be writing to the region node. And the region node in memory is going to be holding this guy right here, which is an LSM tree. So if we recall, an LSM tree in SS table is a type of database index whereby you write to an in-memory binary search tree, and then when that tree gets too big, we flush all of the data out to an SS table, which is basically the data in the LSM tree, but sorted, and that's held on hard drive, so HDD. And so basically what will happen is once this LSM tree on the region node gets too big, you can see that we're going to go ahead and flush it to an SS table on disk on the data node. So keep in mind that the data node is part of Hadoop, right? It's part of HDFS. And what happens to things that get sent as files to Hadoop? They get replicated. How do they get replicated? Through the replication pipeline. Now, if you remember from last video, what that basically means is that we've got one data node sending a write to another data node, which sends a write to another data node. And then you pass the chain of acknowledgments all the way back through to the original data node. And eventually, you know, it gets propagated over to the name node, which then updates its metadata store. And so that's exactly how HBase is going to do things as well. Basically, all of the SS tables that are eventually flushed to HDFS are going to be replicated through that replication pipeline. And that is how we make sure that we have fault tolerance in our data. Of course, we also have something like a write ahead log on our region node to make sure that our LSM tree doesn't get lost if the region node were to crash or something like that. But generally speaking, the point here is that we have HBase, which kind of manages our LSM trees, and then HDFS, which is going to manage the replication of our SS tables. And then additionally, HBase is going to be managing our partitioning, and effectively, every single region node is going to be a different partition. And so as you can see, this guy would have a separate LSM tree, which is then going to flush separate SS tables and those can be replicated however Hadoop sees fit to either this node or to this node down here. The point is we can think of the replication part as a black box. Hadoop is taking care of that for us. Okay, so another key aspect of HBase that is super useful is that it uses column-oriented storage. Now we've spoken about this a decent amount in the past, especially when it comes to Parkit, which is an open source way of kind of performing column-oriented storage. Parkit files are a type of file. But basically, just to reiterate on the difference, we've got row-oriented storage, which basically has every single row of data next to one another on disk. And then differently, we have column-oriented storage, where we take every single column and we put those next to one another on disk. So this would be the name column. And then below it, we would have all of the rows in the same order for the attractiveness column. 
And so what that allows us to do is say we want to perform an analytical query over the attractiveness column where we say, okay, well, what's the mean attractiveness over this data set? Instead of having to pull in all of that name data, we can cancel that out, just pull in the attractiveness data, and then say, oh, well, it's 10 plus 5 plus 2 plus 1 over 4, which is 18 over 4, which is 4.5, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But even better than that is assuming we are using Parkit here for our column oriented storage, we could actually store some general stats of the column, uh, which is kind of nice. We can cache those. So we could have things like the min, the max of the column, or, and even the average in general. So that would be useful for us. And of course, if these column values are super similar as well, we can perform some column compression to basically just speed up our queries and also minimize the amount of data on disk that we're taking up. So just in general, the kind of gist of column-oriented storage is this right here, which is that it is better for analytics queries because we have better data locality. And in addition to that, that makes it better for batch processes as well because it means that all of the data that we want is closer to one another on disk. It means that we have to send less data over the network. There's less coordination that has to be done when kind of aggregating and organizing the data and sorting it. And so as a result, HBase allows us to organize our data in a way that is really, really good for these batch processes without having to sacrifice the fact that, you know, making an individual write to a piece of the data requires an entire file overwrite, which is super expensive. Additionally, besides the column-oriented storage part, we're also using range-based partitioning. And so imagine, you know, we partition data this way right here. This can be really nice because let's say we were handling timestamp data or something and we wanted to do a batch query that let's say calculated like a trailing average of the last five data points. If we were using hash range based partitioning, all of our timestamps would probably be on different nodes organized pretty randomly. But when we use range based partitioning, it means that all of the timestamps that are similar to one another are going to be on the same node. And again, that just means passing less data over the network and we can perform our computations a little bit quicker. That's kind of a niche thing, but even still, it doesn't really hurt for this type of thing. Okay, so what is the conclusion of HBase? Well, generally speaking, we probably don't want to be using it just for a normal client facing application, right? Because at the end of the day, if we just want to perform a bunch of writes and then read from the partition that we've just written to, we don't really need HBase for that. We can use something like Cassandra where we're still getting all of the benefits of the LSM tree for writes. We have leaderless replication to write and read from even faster. And just in general, you know, we don't necessarily need column oriented storage because generally speaking, we just want to fetch one row at a time and probably all of the values of that one row. And so row oriented storage happens to be better in that case. But on the other hand, if we kind of want a wrapper around HDFS, which gives us the freedom to still do normal database operations while also having the ability to perform big batch computations, then HBase might be a better system for us. This could be really useful for things like certain sensor readings, uh, just general data points that we may have to modify down the line where we're not just writing them once and then reading them back in the future. And so as a result of that, keep HBase in mind when you see a use case like this. I imagine it probably won't come up too much during the systems design interview just because, I don't know, it's kind of a nuanced system. And a lot of the things that we're doing in the interview probably aren't getting that in depth. But even still, I think it's important to understand why HBase exists in the first place, how it's a big improvement over something like Hadoop, and how also it falls short of something like Cassandra when it comes to just typical reads and writes for your normal client-side application. Anyways, guys, I hope you have a great day. Hope the video was informative, and I will see you in the next one.